If you haven't heard about the new documentary, Invisible Portraits, executive produced by Ogi Ibuno and Mike Meyer, you'll want to take a few minutes and listen to this moving interview. Invisible Portraits is a powerful and moving documentary that will be aired on the OWN Oprah Winfrey Network on March 2nd. Director Ogi Ibuno calls it a re-education and it is being referred to as a love letter to black women. I believe it's one of the most important documentaries of the decade. The film shares stories of the past, present, and hopes for the future of black women in America. It is both powerful and moving, and I think everyone should add it to their must-see list. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. From the beginning, everything was set up for us not to survive. We were meant to survive as units of labor. We were meant to survive as commodities. Society's views toward black women are framed through these particular images. She's aggressive, violent, out of control. That's all you are. It flies in the face of the reality of who we are. For decades, all we wanted was to be accepted and visible instead of invisible. The only way that can happen is if we ensure that it happens by creating our own narrative and knowing our own stories. You have to be able to give words to it, give names to it. If you don't tell your own story, somebody else will. By telling our own stories, there is a kind of fierce independence of mind, of will, tenacity. No matter what stands in our way, no matter how hard it gets, still we rise. I will stay strong. I'm never giving up. Faith. I will go on. Go all the way. This will be the day. There's nothing more beautiful. Brave. Unbossed. Loving, independent, strong, divine. I think that black women are divine. I recently sat down with executive producer Michael Meyer to understand the genesis of this powerful film and why he made it his mission to make it. Well, hello. I am very excited to have a very special guest with you today, Mr. Michael Meyer. He is Skyping in from uh, across the ocean here. Um, good morning, Michael. How are you? Good morning, Heather. I'm doing great. Thank you. Happy uh, Super Bowl Sunday. That's right. That's right. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Mike Meyer, let me just uh, help bring that into focus for you. Mike is currently the head of global sales and training for Seaport Global. Mike, tell us a little bit about what Seaport Global is, what Seaport Glo Global does, and a little bit about your background. Yes, yeah, so um, Seaport Global is a uh, full-service investment bank um, that started 20 years ago. I joined them um, uh, 11 years ago, and uh, right uh, around the time of the financial crisis, I had been working at large uh, institutions, uh, financial institutions like Bank of America and Credit Suisse, UBS, and decided to do something um, a bit more entrepreneurial that, uh, you know, uh, that opportunity came about uh, during the financial crisis of 08 or 09, when the banking system was under a lot of stress and there was a need for, um, you know, some new entrants in the market. Uh, and I uh, went to work uh, at Seaport Global when they had about 35 people or so, and they charged me with um, helping them expand and grow. And we're at over 300 people now, which, you know, is uh, the significant thing about that number is, you know, the financial industry has been shrinking and our firm has been able to grow, you know, 10 times in size uh, over the last 10 years in an industry that, um, you know, has been, um, you know, downsizing. I feel lucky that it, uh, it's been a passion rather than a job. And it's, it's been a really, really enjoyable experience to 
to go and do something uh, entrepreneurial, um, you know, at this, uh, at this point of my career. Well, I know you're being very, very humble. I, I'd like to have a separate podcast where we talk about your passion in the bond world and the finance world, because you do have a lot to say. And I think you do have a lot to share with some uh, potential mentee that's coming up. But today, I'd like to focus on something that seems to be a little different than your normal everyday path, um, a project that uh, I became aware of. And I have to say, I'm so impressed and I'm so proud of you for bringing this to the forefront. What I'm talking about is a new film. Um, it's called Invisible Portraits. And let's just start by telling people what this project is all about. What does the film focus on? And we'll dive a little deeper after that. Yeah, so, um, and, you know, as you said, we will dive a little bit deeper into the background. But, you know, the film, um, you know, is a love letter, uh, you know, to, uh, to Black women, um, you know, and, you know, that's the words of the director, Ogi. And uh, you know it, it it evolved you know over a uh, over a decade period. Uh, Ogie started working on it about three years ago. She took um, a, a vision that I had, and uh, it evolved uh, as she was doing her research to a uh, you know to the film that it became. And you know as she has talked about on the Today Show and you know CNBC, MSNBC, and you know articles, uh, the tagline she says is that it's first and foremost. A love letter, um, you know, to black women. So it's a, a bit of a, a historical perspective of uh, black women in the United States, and uh, you know what the headwinds that they have faced, um, you know, over centuries, uh, you know, since they you know got to the United States, and uh, kind of so it's the you know the past, um, you know, the present, and and a bit of the future gets uh, discussed in the uh, in the film. Well, I've seen the film. Um, I watched the trailer just before we came on and it still moves me. I think this is one of the most important and moving documentaries that I've seen probably in 10 years. Okay, so let's dissect this a little bit. You are not the most likely character to be featuring or highlighting or focusing on a film like this at first glance. So how did you get involved with this? Where did the idea come from? What was the catalyst? 13 or so years ago, um, you know, I was watching um, um, Isaiah Thomas, you know, the great basketball player from Chicago being inducted into the, uh, the hall of fame. And, you know, as he got, you know, the presenters, you know, talked about his, great prowess on the basketball court, what a great leader he was. And um, as he reached the podium to start his speech, um, you know, he, uh, the first person he addressed um, was his mother. And um, I don't know the exact details of this, but I think Isaiah is one of nine children, um, comes from a big family. And he, um, you know, started the speech and said, I'm the proud son of Mary Thomas. And he just broke down into tears and he really couldn't even control, you know, his emotions. Right. And it, it really, you know, like stuck with me as he started to talk about his mother, the influence uh, his mother had on his life, you know, and, and made him, you know, the, the, the person he was and, and really addressed, uh, you know, his success was uh, in a large part due to her and how she, her discipline and how she made him, you know, to be a, an exceptional man. So it, it kind of hit me like, you know, uh, one of those kind of aha moments, you know, where as the, um, the filming of the, uh, the speech, it would panoramic back to her sitting down watching it and her crying as well. And I said to myself, these women are some of the most important Americans that exist, you know, without any looking for recognition, they get up and, you know, they, they faced headwinds that are going back generational and they get up every day, they do the right thing, you know, many of it on their own, you know, where they are um, um, single parents many of the times. And, and, and she, you know, obviously raising all these children and giving them education, teaching them religion, teaching the importance of family. And I, I said to myself, these women are silent warriors that live amongst us. 
and and in my imagination, I almost you know felt that uh, you know they should be walking down the streets with camouflage uh, outfits on because they're they're warriors and 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 uh, soldiers. Uh, and you know when when everybody's you know which they deserve is is acknowledging the SEAL team and the work that they do, um, and they get celebrated all the time. I, I said to myself, you know, these women. You know that um, they're like SEAL team members themselves, but uh, they don't get recognized properly. Um, you know, as incredibly important pieces of the foundation of American society, but they've never looked for recognition. You know, they've never been, from what I could tell, um, acknowledged properly. Um, you know, so so I said, you know, I, I want to do um, do something, and the thing that hit me was to do a documentary on these mothers you know, that were such powerful influences. So I started to look at other speeches of, you know, important um, African-American men. And many of them, many of them had situations where as they talked about their mother or their grandmother, you know, this powerful female figure in their lives, you know, the emotion would just take over them about the sacrifices, you know, that they had made for their children to get where they were. And I said, something has to be done here to, to bring this to light. Uh, and I did some work uh, to find out if anything had really been done in any meaningful way, and it hadn't been. So I kind of set on a journey to, um, to celebrate these um, you know, black mothers. Now, Ogi, you know, which we can get into, um, you know, it evolved as she was doing her work, which I was fully behind, but it initially started you know, as a celebration of, of black mothers. And I started talking to a bunch of different directors over about a 10 year period. And for, what, for whatever reason, none of them um, wanted to do it. Uh, none of them, um, the budget was too high, they, they told me, or, or you know, they thought it was too controversial. And then I met Ogi and uh, it took off from there. Okay, so let's lead into, that takes us to Ogi. So she is your director. How did the two of you get connected? Well, um, a friend of mine who I'd gone to uh, college, no, I had not gone to college with, who was younger than me, but we had met through um, connections. Uh, we'd all, uh, we'd gone to Duke University and um, she um, happened to be friends of a friend and she was in the film industry in Los Angeles. Um, and occasionally we would meet up and, and have a dinner and I was in Los Angeles and um, I said, let's meet up. And she said, by the way, I, I and I had told her, because she was in the film industry, I told her years earlier about my idea and, and she loved the idea and it stuck with her as well. And so she said to me, she goes, Michael, I have somebody I'd like you to meet. I think she's the perfect person to do your project. Um, would you be entertain meeting her? And I said, absolutely. Um, you know, as I said, this has been going on for 10 years that I've been interviewing directors and it just, well, you know, obviously I have a sec another job, but you know, it, so it always stayed with me and said, I, I want to get this done. I kind of hoped somebody else might have already taken the initiative and done it, but it didn't happen. And so it kind of stayed with me. And, uh, you know, and so she said, would you meet uh, my friend who I'm really impressed with? You know, I've seen her work uh, and she was working for Colin Firth uh, at the time, his um, you know, production company. Uh, and so I met, I met her at a hotel in Los Angeles. I showed her the video I, before we did anything. I said, I want you to watch this video. And I showed her the video of Isaiah Thomas giving this speech. And um, she was looking at it, looking at me. And, um, you know, she got emotional as well um, as she watched the video. And then I said, this is my idea. And, um, and she looked at me like, you know, you know, as she had, has told reporters and television, she said she couldn't believe that she was looking at a 50 year old white man you know, um, that was pitching her on an idea to celebrate, um, you know, black mothers in a documentary. And um, so she, she didn't say yes that day, but she, she said that she was going to um, um, give it some, some deep thought. And I think she went to who, uh, one of her best friends, um, it was Halle Berry. And she went to Halle Berry and um, uh, she asked Halle uh, uh, what she thought. And Halle said, you have to do it. And she came back to me within a couple of days and said, let's start, she goes, I want to do it. Let's start talking about it. And, uh, and, and that's how it, uh, it got going. So that was about, was about over, a little over three years ago, I think. Wow. Okay. So hooray for Hallie for encouraging her yeah. to do that. Sure. Um, so this film was made, obviously this is kind of timely now. 
uh, with the movement of 2020. But this film was made several years ago. And I'm going to fast track you a little bit to the release date. You had planned to release this a little bit later than it actually was released. Uh, it was released on Juneteenth of 2020, correct? Can you yes. tell me how that came about? Yeah, as, as some of the um, uh, racial tensions started to um, you know, bubble um, around Breonna Taylor, the Floyd situation. Um, I'm she, she, yeah, yeah, and, and, and she came to me and, and said, listen, Michael, um, I know that we were planning on doing this later in the year and we were gonna do a lot of production um, uh, advertising. Um, you know, we, you know we, hired, we had hired a, um, a PR agency to kind of spend a period that we were gonna actually uh, go to about five or six cities, big cities around the United States and do premieres of the movie, you know, in various cities, uh, showings in various cities. And she said, listen, Michael, the time is right. It, it, nobody's going to be really almost believe the fact that this movie was started three years ago, given the, uh, you know, what's going on in the world right now. And she said, you know, it's really important, I think, that we, um, you know, get this out now while there's a lot of awareness, you know, around, uh, you know, around this topic. And uh, that was, you know, obvious to me as well. And I said, absolutely, go for it. And so, um, you know, she released it on uh, Juneteenth and, um, you know, got some really good write-ups um, and, and had some great interviews, as I said, on the Today Show and, you know, other very credible, um, you know, uh, uh, news shows, et cetera. And, uh, and it kind of just took off from there. Yes. Well, and that's when you and I got connected and then I saw it and I was so moved. I have to say that I probably wrote 10 pages of notes with emotion that was, I wasn't prepared for. Obviously I have a completely different perspective than Ogi or anybody else would have, but it was moving and I felt enraged. I felt sad. I felt empathetic. I felt like, where have I been? I thought I knew the whole story, but I really didn't. And what do you hope people will take away once they see this, see this film, no matter where they come from, what color they are, what their circumstances are, what is the overall hope that you have for this film? Well, you just said it to a T in terms of how it made you feel. And if uh, I would say that if, um, you know, Ogie was, uh, you know, on this uh, uh, with us right now, she would say, if I could hit one person like it, it had occurred to you, then then that is a win for this world. And you know the hope is for all the words that you just used. Um, you know when she was if she herself had a uh, went through a, a a permanent transformation as she was doing the years of research mm. because um, because of how education of this topic has um, evolved mm. over the decades, uh, centuries. You know, it's taken on a different form. And it, it, it you know, Ogie said during the process, she was Michael, the, the world needs to be re-educated, re-educated into the truth of, of everything that, that's happened and where we are. And, you know, it, it, she had to take a break at one point in the filming, I believe, uh, because of, of how emotional it became for her, you mm -hmm. know, doing, doing the deep research uh, and working with these incredibly impressive African-American scholars that uh, um, you see throughout the film. You know, so the educational aspect of it, you know, just bringing emotion and bringing awareness, you know, to this, we believe, you know, Ogie believes that, uh, you know, it could have a real impact as, as it, uh, as it kind of makes its way through, uh, you know, through society. My goal was for education, yes. um, you know, that it would, that it would get into the education system. Um, be, you know, you know, Ogie did a lot of work, you know, as I said earlier, that nothing like this has ever been done. And, and the hope was that, and the hope is that it will get into the education system at all levels as part of the curriculum. You know, in the meantime, you know, the double kind of, you know, win here is it'll, it will get into the education system. You know, those um, uh, moves have already started and those initiatives already have already started from Ogie. But at the same time, because of the timing of what was going on in the world, it's actually getting even a bigger awareness. And um, we think that it, um, it's, it's just gonna start. You know, Oprah Winfrey, uh, she bought the, um, the rights to it for her Oprah Winfrey Network. And it's gonna be premiering on March 2nd on the Oprah Winfrey Network. And 
you know, so that's going to bring a whole nother level of this. And we think that it's a, it really is, is just beginning. That is very excited. So how does Ogi feel about Oprah having it premiere on her network? Does she feel finally someone is going to be listening to this? Obviously, you're the one who came up with the idea, so you must be feeling that way. How does that make the bold of you feel? Yeah, no, listen, I, I'm so proud of the work that Ogie's done. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, as he said, it started with an idea that I had that her creativeness and uh, her great um, you know, director of debut, she kind of took it and ran with it and turned it into the work of art that it is now. And, and getting somebody you know, like Oprah Winfrey away from, you know, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the news um, interviews that she's done and the, the write-ups in the, you know, the various um, you know, uh, periodicals that covered it, you know, getting Oprah Winfrey's um, to, to, to buy it, um, you know, sponsor it, um, and 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 actually have a real premiere for it, you know. I think about it is as good of um, you know acknowledgement of of what what uh, was created by by Ogi, and um, you know I'm just really happy that I was part of it and couldn't be more proud of the work that she has done. And I'm looking forward. I've probably seen it ten times, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing it again. I, I I get something new out of it every single time I watch it. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm excited. I uh, will definitely share it with our listeners, but Oprah obviously has the, one of the largest megaphones in the world. So um, I, I think that acknowledgement right there is fantastic. I love the idea about getting it into the education system. When I first watched it, I thought, where was this when I was going to school? Where was this point of view? It needed to be told. And I was kind of surprised it hadn't been told in this way before. I grew up, I was born in the South, you know, in the 60s. Um, which was still a, you know, racially charged atmosphere. Yes. Um, and I witnessed it, you know, um, but both of my parents were from the North and, um, you know, they had moved, you know, I grew up in, uh, you know, in Virginia, the Northern part of Virginia, which is really more kind of, I guess, the Mid-Atlantic, not the Deep South, but there are enough people in Alexandria, Virginia, where I grew up, you know, that were generational Southerners. And, you know, I got to see, you know, um, you know, from a perspective that my parents gave me, you know, coming from the North, um, uh, being taught a deep sense of racial equality. Right. Um, you know, <clears throat> I was one of six children and my mother, you know, needed help. You know, we grew up middle class and, and we had some help with the six children. Um, they generally, you know, were, um, you know, African-American women. And <clears throat> there was one particular woman, her name was Mary Brown. And she was from North Carolina and, you know, I was in love with her. Love it. And so, you know, and so it was, it gave me a perspective, you know, growing up in the South, seeing um, a lot of, you know, racial incidences, but also coming from a, a place of awareness of how bad that was. And so it, it became part of the fabric of how I looked at the world, um, you know, thanks to my parents. Well, I think it is so important. What is your hope for the film going forward now? So March 2nd is a, is a very big day for you. So what is your hope? Do you think it will be distributed worldwide um, because of her network? What's your hope and your dream for this film? Maybe if we sit down and talk a year from now. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So, you know, after, you know, you know because I have a full-time job that takes, that takes a lot of my time, once I handed it to Ogie, she, you know, she kind of, you know, took it and kind of has run with it and kind of has been the steward of this project. And, and we catch up about, you know, what the next steps are. And so, you know, the, obviously the next big step is, you know, as it premieres, um, you know, in early March on Oprah Winfrey's network. And then from there, you know, the network has given us the, um, the in the contract that we signed with them, the latitude to, you know, take the film outside of her network and have a lot of, of, of license of where it can go in terms of, you know, whether it's, you know, going on Netflix or, you know, just giving us the ability to take it as wide of an, and see if, of a wide of an audience as we can get it to, whether it's through, you know, Hulu or Netflix or Amazon Prime. Um, I know that Ogie has already had conversations with, you know, major universities, you know, that um, have talked about it getting into the education system. And, and I think that that's something that I'd like to work with her on even more, which is even getting into high schools and, and, and you know, and just so we can get, you know, as broad as possible, you know, out to the, uh, to the world, which includes, 
um, you know, um, an international aspect to it. Well, I'm sure that that will be very, very successful. So your main line of work, um, I know you, you work very hard. You work very long hours. You're very, very successful. You're quite humble about it. So did you think that this would be a, um, a left turn a little bit? This could be a full-time career for you because obviously you're onto something here. Ever thought about that? Yeah, you know, I, uh, if there's a lane or a door that opens up, um, you know, that, is obvious to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna run right through it as it relates to this, and you know I um, you know because of this experience that I've had, and you know as I said, it goes back over a decade that that this first initiative thing that I saw with Isaiah Thomas. That uh, you know as a side note, um, one of my friends, um, closest friends, is Quinn Snyder, who's the head coach of the Utah Jazz, and I told him about it, and he sent Isaiah. He knew Isaiah Thomas just from the basketball community. And, um, you know, Isaiah Thomas um, watched the film on the day of the premiere, which came out on Vimeo. And he wrote me a really long text that he had sat down and watched it with his family um, and watched it with his entire family. And, um, you know, how proud that he was actually a part of this, you know, that he was the inspiration or even more so that his mother was the inspiration. So as a side note, that was a a great um, you know thing for me. But, uh, you know, to that point, yeah, again, if 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 a door, if I see a door that I want to go through as it relates to the you know these types of initiatives around you know um, racial equality, and one of the things that I'm working on right now is is helping with the uh, minority um, uh, broker dealers in the uh, the minority investment banks you know that work on Wall Street, and uh, so I've started um, some initiatives um, around you know. Um, potentially, um, uh, it's just starting, potentially helping minority investment banks, um, you know, uh, achieve success. And uh, it could it could come from an investment from my firm, it could come from a personal investment. But, um, but that's kind of been the one of the next um, levels of this for me, uh, has been starting to look into, you know, how I can kind of, you know, push the, uh, the situation around, uh, you, know, w- you know, what started, you know, I really believe that, you um, What's happened in the last year, you know, um, uh, is some of the most important initiatives that have been made, you know, throughout the world in in racial equality, and it's just starting. And uh, you know, I, I believe that this past year is, is going to be looked at as as a starting point for a push that's going to have permanent change. I, I'd say it's the big shift. So you are definitely a force for good. You're definitely onto something. Any way I can help you here at Mentors and Moguls, uh, I'm all on board. I applaud your efforts. We need more people like Mike Meyer because you're going above and beyond uh, what most people would do. And I just applaud you for that. So thank you so much for your contributions to date. Well, thank you, Heather. Thank you very much. As I said, it uh, you know it, it it became a passion and. You know, after many, many years, it just stuck with stuck with me. People said, How, "Why did it stick with you?" And and you know, um, I feel like it came from like something spiritual, you know, that 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 you know made me stick with it and actually get it done because it it, it was it was something that you know as it started over a decade ago, and and it, and it finally uh, you know came to uh, you know fruition, which uh, you know something that I almost can't explain. You know why it stood with me. And, uh, and that's why I almost bring the spiritual aspect of it, is that I believe there was a higher power involved in, uh, in helping me with this. I think it was meant to be. I absolutely believe it was meant to be. Yeah. Well, Mike, I could talk to you all day about your other projects, but I'm going to let you go for now. I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you so much for sharing with me and the audience a little bit about this film, Invisible Portraits, out on March 2nd. And everyone should watch for it. And I... I Get somebody that you care about and sit down and watch it. And you better have uh, some Kleenex close by because it's, it's, it's going to get you whether you think so or not. It's it's wonderful. Thank you so very much. Heather, thank you so much. And thank you for taking the interest in this. Uh, You know, you're going to be, you know, one of the catalysts, uh, you know, to keep this, uh, the momentum going. So thank you. I love it. Thank you so much. Great day. Thank you. You too.